It's a grace, very graceful voice. <laughs> Isn't it? Yep. See if that clicker works. Ah, uh, it should. Yep. It does. All right. Can you can you guys see the the screen, the, the shared screen? Just just making yep. sure. Yep. Chris. All right. Awesome. Thanks. So let me introduce you know the the folks that put this thing together. Uh, I have I have Maciej Wenski, uh, who is together with me. We're we're the solutions architect working for for Red Hat. Uh, so we work a lot with the customers. We we've, we've done you know like hundreds of POCs and like uh, Maciej is a is a really strong networking guy. You know like we uh, when we ask him to to join the team, we we knew he's very strong from from that area. Um, and we also have uh, another, like the best expert uh, you can get on the phone, Emilian uh, Maki. He's a senior principal, principal software engineer. Uh, so he's going to be presenting uh, part of this, and and some of us, you know, and that, we were we're going to focus on the OpenStack piece, and then Emilian is going to focus on on the Kubernetes part. Uh, this is, you know, like we're going to try to make it as uh, you know, the, obviously this, this session kind of we uh, is, is presented by Red Hat, but we're going to try to make it as, as uh, you know, open source as possible, right? Since this is a, this is a MIA, but there's going to be some pieces that are, you know, being developed from the product perspective, right? So just, just, just keep that uh, in mind. Yeah, so anything else for the introduction or you guys? And again, please ask us a question like this is, this is a meetup, so it should be as interactive as possible. Uh, let's let's try to make it just you know just. I wish you were here. You could throw like bananas at us if we're you know <laughs> tomato. <laughs> tomato. We have some tomatoes in the back. All right. So I think we're gonna go pretty deep technically, but I want to kind of start with uh, with kind of a level set and maybe you know I don't know how many people are super technical in this call and. So I'm gonna go over over this quickly. It's like a I put this like as an evolution of the of the data center, right? So how it all started, like we had just a, a bare metal box, we would uh, put it in the rack, we would put some uh, Cisco or Juniper switches on the top, then the operating system would, would land on it, and then I don't know, it would be Windows or, or Linux, and then your database or web server or whatever it is, right? So so old technology. <laughs> All of that uh, became abstracted. I think I think IBM was the first company who uh, who invented the you know the virtualizations with the with the IBM L pars, right? So they were able to slice a single piece of uh, silicon, if you will, into into a multiple virtual silicons. And then, but really, VMware is the company who who took it to the market, and they pretty much even up to this day they. They own majority of the hypervisor market. So this has changed. Like there was still the physical uh, compute box uh, with some traditional networkings, and then you know there was a there was an influx of like traditional stores like SANs or fiber channels, etc. Right, and then you would slice that PC in multiple pieces, put the OS and an application on on top. Right, and then kind of the next step in the evolution was the cloud. Right, so AWS came came out and they said, hey, we give you everything as a service, right? And everything is software defined. Everything uh, is as a code, right? And and they came up with this really cool stuff and everyone liked it. And you know, there was this company called Rackspace together with NASA and they said, hey, we want that, but just in the private cloud, right? So they took that concept, uh, they kind of detached all of the proprietary software from the proprietary hardware, right? So, so all the networking storage and compute became software defined, right? And then, uh, and then Kubernetes came in and they said, hey, let's abstract all of this OS, we don't care about any of it, and then let's just put like orchestrations of the, of the application in the containers, right? So that's kind of the, the very right side of this, uh, of this slide. And then, but then AWS always did it better, right? Because they always had the concept of like availability zones, right? Like an ability to, to split this architecture 
into multiple failure domains, right? So, so it was hard to attract, uh, at least from our perspective, attract like either customers or users into this, into the large deployments because we were always layer two, right? Everything over layer two. So, you know, one one part of your infrastructure fails and the and the whole thing dies. So then, you know, what we do from the from the private cloud perspective, from the OpenStack and then Kubernetes, we're going to talk about is taking these these boxes and pretty much distributing them across the availability zones, across the layer three uh, network network domain. All right. So quickly, uh, I don't know how if there's someone on the on the call that's not super familiar with the with the AWS or public cloud, but these are some of the core services you can consume today in, a, in AWS, right? So you, on the compute side, you have your EC2, EKS, Lambda, right? On the networking, you have your VPC, ELB, KMS. So there's a bunch of these services that Amazon came up with, and then open, so open source community. Uh, hello. Hey, how's it going? Hey, good, how are you? Good. Uh, please help yourself with the food. <laughs> I don't know. We, we just know. started, so you're you know you're not you're not super late. Like, awesome. Everyone. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. So so you know Amazon came up with all these services, and they keep adding it. Like today, if you go to the Amazon you know AWS website, there's probably hundreds of different services, right? But the the, the open source community, they were trying to match as many of them as you, as as they could. Uh, obviously, it's impossible to match all of them, but uh, we kind of, you know, from the between OpenStack and Kubernetes, we were able to map a bunch of these uh, services with these open source projects, right? So let's say Heat is your equivalent of the cloud formation, right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Cinder is your equivalent of EBS. Uh, ELB is your Octavia, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I can share these slides with, if you, if you know, if you guys are interested, uh, and then you can see how I mapped everything together. But this is kind of the ecosystem that allow you to solve majority of the data center, uh, in, you know, issues, right? Or the, 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 the as a service pieces. All right, I'm going to pause. Do you, anyone, anyone have any question or? So far, so good. That makes sense. All right. So far, so good, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're starting at pretty high level, but we're going to go much deeper in, in a moment. Uh, so yeah, so OpenStack and Kubernetes, they're like match made in heaven. <laughs> uh, and you know, they solve different, you know, they're trying to aim at solving different use cases and different problems, although there is a lot of overlap between them, right? Uh, and you know we're we're gonna we're gonna talk about like we're gonna start with the OpenStack deployment topologies and and distributed OpenStack deployment topologies, right? So the kind of evolution again, right? So the the version number one, and this is something from the Red Hat perspective as a product, uh, we were able to do this since uh, OSP thirteen, I think, which was uh, train no no train sixteen train sixteen Queens Queens. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, so what we did here is uh, we were able to put uh, the control plane in like one layer two, and then split the compute uh, resources with the storage, if you will, and then put them in a in additional layer two. So, so we were able to distribute, you know, the OpenStack architecture, if you will, uh, over multiple. Oh, over layer three, and then and this was this is excellent architecture for like this geographically distributed uh, use cases, right? Uh, the the disadvantage of this is right like if your central location, right? If, if this AZ zero dies, well, you know the the AZ one and AZ two and AZ three workloads are still up and they can function and communicate. But you can no longer, I don't know, spawn new VMs or spawn new volumes or spawn new networks, right? So you know it, it has some issues. The advantages of it, though, is uh, they are pretty resilient from the latency perspective, right? So you can like Red Hat supports pushing these AZ1, AZ2, AZ3s 
to like 100 uh, milliseconds round trip uh, latency, and it's and it's supported. We did like uh, the team that me and Maciej work on. We do these hackfests every every year. Or so every new release, we do the hackfests when we try to push our software to the limits. We were actually able to like inject 250 millisecond latency between the sites, and we could still operate, you know, pretty well. But you know, obviously, if you if you're running production, you want to you want to be in a supported uh, in a supported architecture, if you will. Uh, yeah, but you know, still very very cool architecture, and we actually have a lot of customers today running this. And I we talked to the customer today that is looking to build hundred uh, DCN locations of a single uh, control plane, if you will. So so replicating this architecture with the single uh, like three nodes DCN uh, clusters ac across the uh, US. All right, and then version two of that, and this is also something we've done for the uh, for the customer, is we, uh, this, this customer was like a financial institution, institutions, and they were trying to get as many uh, nines in their SLAs as possible. They, they actually came in and they say, we need, uh, I think it was six nines in, in, you know, in our architecture for the applications. It was super important for them. So we came up with, with this architecture where we, uh, it looks similar to the one before, the difference is we stretched the control plane across multiple failure domains, right? So it was layer two stretch control plane, uh, but physically across multiple, uh, you know, it was single data center, but you know, different power deliveries. Uh, and there was a good amount of uh, resiliency built in there. Uh, and in this, in this kind of architecture, you can take the Kubernetes, and, and Emilian's gonna talk a little bit more about that, but you can also stretch that across multiple AZs, right? So you, you get the extra resiliency from both uh, your VMs running on OpenStack and your you know, containers running on top of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, again, the storage is kind of local per AZ, so there's no, there's no storage traffic uh, traversing the DC core. Uh, and, and it actually works really, really well. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's still some disadvantage though, right? Like this stretched L2 control plane for, for both today, for both, like in this architecture, for both yeah. OpenStack and Kubernetes, uh, you know, it's not everyone likes to do it, right? Uh, it, it adds complexity to your, like, made, like the life cycle of your, of your cloud, right? Uh, because you have to ensure all of the, you know, the, the, the L2 is, is, is working properly across these ACs. Uh, but it, it solved the use case, and, and, and then now we're going to talk about the version 3, which is the, which is the cool stuff. And I'm going to turn it over to Machi. Okay, so I, as Chris mentioned in, in version 2, the control plane was stretched across sites. But it was still using layer two. Uh, in version three, where we're going is we want to introduce layer three routing to both the control plane and data. So in version two, we had distributed compute locations. So the data plane was already using layer three, but the control plane was still not dead. We had to stretch that control plane using layer two networking, and that was the only way to make it work. In this version three of, of the distributed data center, we're going pure layer three. What does that mean? That means that both control plane and data plane networks are going to be routed across a distributed set of, uh, dedicated set of routers. We call those spine routers. And each of the locations or sites or availability zones is considered a leap. In, in such architecture, the east-west traffic always has to traverse the spine. So if our leaf one wants to send any control plane traffic to leaf two, it, this traffic always has to traverse the spine. And that same concept applies for our data plane traffic. So we're using the same idea of, of distributing both control plane and data plane networks. Uh, there is multiple advantages to that. Um, you, we're separating our failure domains. Uh, 
we of course have discrete broadcast domains at each location, uh, which makes for easier troubleshooting. And uh, the core technology here that we want to highlight though that we're using to make that happen is dynamic routing using BGP. Now let's talk a little bit about how the control plane uh, using layer three is, is implemented. So the controllers here are represented using those uh, purple uh, bubbles and what we're doing is we're not any more limited by the network boundaries. The layer two networking is not imposing any more limitations. Um, we can scale much easier. The way this is done is that Pacemaker, which is responsible for installing the BIP IP addresses of the active control node, um, is actually using loopback addresses to install those addresses instead as in the old deployment in uh, OpenStack uh, train, aka Red Hat OpenStack Platform 16, uh, those loopback addresses were, uh, those VIP addresses were installed on the provided bridge responsible for the control plane network. And this time we're installing those VIP addresses on a loopback interface, and there's an open source routing daemon that redistributes those addresses into the BGP enabled control plane where all the controllers, all the network nodes, and all the compute nodes are listening. With respect to the control plane, we only care about the controllers. So we have these VIPs now ready available, advertised in our BGP enabled network, and a Pacemaker takes care of um, selecting which node becomes active by installing that VIP address on a loopback interface of the controller that is active. Um, how does the layer three data plane work? Uh, here we're getting into a bit more uh, complicated scenario um, and there is a helper to make it happen. Uh, here's where I wanted to talk about introducing the OVN BGP agent. The OVN BGP agent uh, has a very important function and I'll talk about in detail on exactly what it does in order to make the data plane networks be able to advertise over BGP. The main advantages, of course, is that we're distributing our data, our data plane. Uh, we're not limited by network boundaries, and we can scale easier. So how does traffic processing work in this, in this model? Um, and on the data planes, on, on the data plane networks, uh, the data, data plane networks are those that are hosting your workloads, so your containers, your VMs, uh, attached to networks. The provider bridges which are attached to these networks uh, in OVN are not assigned with any NICs. In practice what that means is that the traffic doesn't know how to reach that provider bridge. So we have to do some tricks using Linux networking. First is enable proxy ARP. Proxy ARP makes sure that any ARP requests that normally would be unanswered. Um, there's no core changes in Neutron uh, or OVN in order to make that happen. So any app requests which would normally be answered by on the layer two network now are answered by the kernel. So if we turn our proxy ARP on that bridge, those ARP requests will always be answered. The same applies for network discovery protocol for IPv6. So if we're using dual stack, enable that NDP proxy and that will make sure that these requests are not unanswered. This ensures that, again, any request that is coming in on that bridge will be answered and, and handled appropriately. Um, what this means, in turn, is that when we have, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in detail, we have FRR running on our compute nodes, our controllers, and our computes. FRR is open source routing daemon taking care of BGP, uh, and, uh, and a few other protocols that I'll explain in detail how they work. Ingress traffic processing. What happens when a new VM boots up? And this is the heavy lifting that the OVN BGP agent does. A OVN BGP agent will listen in, in, in the OVN southbound database. And each time there's a new VM booted and this VM gets a new floating IP address assigned or 
it just boots in the provider network and it registers with its new IP address, the OVN BGP agent will pick up on that change. The first thing that will, it will do is it will add a host path with the destination of that uh, VM's IP address in a VRF that is attached to the provider bridge. That instructs the kernel to forward any traffic that is destined to that particular IP address to that bridge. So all the inbound traffic, for example, HTTP requests coming in that is destined for uh, an IP address of interest belonging to a virtual machine or a container, now knows that it has to be get forwarded to that, to that bridge. The next thing that happens, and that is an analogy to what happens on uh, our control plane, is FRR which is our BGP uh, router, will redistribute that host route into BGP and advertise it to all its peers. So now, when we're working in a layer three enabled data center with BGP as, as our routing protocol, all the requests that are destined to that particular VM or container will get forwarded to a, that compute node that is hosting that workload. How does egress traffic processing work in this new scenario when we're using layer three? Again, the OVN BGP agent uh, is our helper here. And an example that I wanted to give is just simple HTTP request out coming out of that VM. So since there is no NICs attached to that bridge, um, we're gonna have to do some interesting things. The first thing is that the OVN BGP agent will do will rewrite destination MAC address of that packet. It will look it up in the OVN database using its flow and then rewrite the destination MAC address to that of the bridge. So that outgoing traffic now hits the bridge. When that outgoing traffic hits that bridge and that bridge has routes for sending traffic outbound, that and rewriting that destination MAC address ensures that this traffic will be subjected to that route table and in our case, uh, we're using uh, FRR advertising default routes into the node, so that traffic can now get out to its destination using those routes. Uh, if we didn't rewrite that MAC address, that traffic would get lost. Let's talk about a little bit of the components of, that make that solution possible. Uh, Free range routing, FRR, I did mention it a, a few times uh, already, so I want to give you a bit more details on what free, free range routing is. FRR is a continuation or a fork, actually, of uh, an older project, um, open source routing daemon called Quagga. And, and you might ask, what does zebras have to do with routing? What do zebras have to do with routing? <laughs> <laughs> well, good that you ask. <laughs> Not much, but in networking, there is actually some, some synergy here. Uh, uh, Quagga existed for many number of years. I remember using it as long as 15 years ago when I was learning BGP, when I was learning OSPI. Yeah. It's an open source routing daemon that's been around for a long time. Except that it didn't see much development in the past few years. There were some bug fixes released, uh, but no new features were implemented. Uh, it was more in the maintenance phase, and it was losing, <coughs> losing interest. About two years ago, um, someone decided that Quagga is a great code base, and uh, it, it should live on. And Quagga still lives on in its own shape. But once it was forked and renamed to Free Range Routing, and you know, it's the analogy of chickens, uh, that's, that's when that project really picked up again. Uh, new features were implemented in it. Uh, for example, uh, BFD, for example, ECMP, uh, IPv6 for BGP. Quagga, in its old original form, didn't exactly have that rich feature set of routing demons that it supports today. FRR works natively on Linux. It performs best on Linux. But it also works on BSD with some caveats. Not all the routing protocols uh, work on BSD systems. Uh, in our case, Quagga provides support for, uh, in, in the context of OpenStack and uh, OpenStack Wallaby, which is uh, 
Red Hat OpenStack version 17, we will be relying on three core pieces of FRR. First is BGP, second is ECMP, and the third one is BFD. And let's, oh, well, before I wanted to mention that FRR um, is implemented using containers and it runs on all of the nodes in the OpenStack deployment. So it will run on compute nodes, controllers, and network nodes, if, if you're using network nodes. Ever, anyone else on the call uh, used Quagga before? Uh, I think everyone I know uses Quagga. Uh, I've learned networking on Quagga. It's a great tool to, to learn. Building home labs, yeah. always enjoyed using Quagga. So when I've seen FRR, I see, I, I see FRR as a, re, re, a reincarnation of Quagga. So it, it warms my heart that there is developers, again, interested in, in pushing it forward, making bug fixes, and, and the project lives on. It used to be, and is, continues to be my favorite learning tool for, for networking and experiments. So what routing protocols we use in, in uh, OpenStack Wallaby, aka Red Hat OpenStack Platform 70, to make a distributed layer 3 control and data plane networks happen? The first one is BGP. BGP is a border gateway, stands for border gateway protocol. It's an exterior routing protocol, and in de facto, that is the routing protocol of the internet. It has been adopted as such. It scales really well. It can handle route tables of, I'm not going to say infinite size, but I believe that the, the global internet routing table in IPv4 must be approaching million routes. <laughs> it, it probably is there right now. <laughs> the last time I looked at the full yeah. feed. Um, BGP is a distance vector routing protocol. What does that mean? That means that the selections done by the routing protocol as far as the next hop processing are based on the shortest path. And what does a path represent in BGP? In BGP, every router identifies itself with an autonomous system number. And when BGP looks at a path to traverse to, to, to some destination, it looks at a path of autonomous systems that the, the routers in its path uh, have. So, of course, the shortest path is preferred. This is the default, um, most basic selection of, uh, of the best path in BGP. And, and there's many other uh, mechanisms that can influence it. But on, on, on a basic level, that's how BGP works. Uh, BGP was also adopted as the default protocol for spine and leaf data center network deployments. Now, the reasoning here is pretty simple. It's because it scales well. And uh, when we want to scale an enterprise data center, we want to pick a protocol that will enable us to scale without further considerations for it. And BGP is that protocol, right? It, it is, de facto, the routing protocol of the whole internet. Top choice for, I, I would say, <coughs> the hyperscale providers as well, right? Yeah, it, um, BGP it made its way from outside the data center yeah. to inside the data center. Now, we're not only routing, you know, it, it is an exterior protocol by design, but because it scales so well, the demands of modern hyperscale data centers are such that BGP is a perfect fit for it as well. Now, BGP is a good routing protocol, but BFD is a very interesting piece that can improve BGP in many aspects. BGP has some shortcomings. Uh, the default hold time is for, for routes. For example, let's assume a scenario where a BGP session between two routers becomes stale. It drops down. There's a network issue. In BGP, there's a property called hold time. This, this hold time refers to the amount of time that a router will hold the routes in its route table, even after it acknowledges that that peer is unreachable. And those timers are only tweakable to a certain degree. And you can imagine that if you have multiple paths available, you want to use those multiple paths to a destination as soon as your primary path goes down. That, that's where BFD comes in. BFD is great at very aggressive, constant monitoring. When integrated with BGP, it will monitor 
every BGP speaker that is enabled on a router. In the case of a failure, it will immediately remove the routes from a route table, allowing the secondary or territory path to take over. I like to call BFD BGP's little helper. <laughs> that is not to say that BFD only works with BGP. BFD actually works with all sorts of routing protocols, including OSPF, um, protocols which are not distance vector routing protocols, uh, link state protocols like OSPF, um, and ERGRP, um, you name it. The BFD has been implemented into pretty much every dynamic routing protocol with one goal, to improve your time to recover. When there's a failure, you want that traffic to switch over to your standby path right away. BFD is great at that. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention that uh, FRR brings to OpenStack is ECMP. ECMP is, stands for Equal Cost Multipath Routing. And that's a pretty simple concept. Um, it allows the kernel to install multiple routes to the same destination. And that aids and you know, those three things we already talked about, how BFD uh, helps you to recover from failures quicker. Um, ECMP is the mechanism that will allow you to have simultaneously installed two routes to the same destination. There's, there's some caveats, of course, about these routes. They have to share some common properties. One of them is, of course, the, the destination. Um, but they also have to have the same metric. They have to be pretty much identical route, except for the next one. Uh, here we wanted to talk about, we wanted to compare the traditional layer 3 architecture to, to spine and leaf. Spine and leaf is the architecture that we're targeting what our V3 version of uh, a layer 3 distributed data center. The traditional layer 3, three layers, I'm sorry, network architecture, not to be confused with layer 3, um, is really built with emphasis on optimizing north-south traffic. We're trying to get traffic in and out of the data center, not so much from east to west, where some traffic actually stays within the data center. High latency creates traffic bottlenecks. Those two, um, that last traffic bottleneck limitation, you know, that's mainly due to the widespread use of, of layer two. Uh, there's, there's no other way uh, to get out of that data center than through your core layer, which can actually support layer three routing. Now we're moving into a spine leaf architecture. We're putting emphasis not only on north-south traffic, you get that almost for free by going out of your topo rack switches to your spines, but you can also efficiently route east-west traffic within the data center. You can distribute your data center um, data plane and, and efficiently route traffic between those availability zones or so-called leaves in here. Uh, the latency in such a deployment is, is lower and much more predictable. Uh, we already mentioned that it's so much easier to scale that kind of a deployment. You just add more blocks of that, making sure um, that those new blocks, are code leaves here, are connected to all your spine routers. Uh, and then a very important feature here is that the failure domains are isolated to the leaf. Why is that? Your failures usually happen within broadcast domains. Broadcast domains are tightly coupled or synonymous with layer two. Now, when we have multiple leaves, each of these leaves can actually use duplicate VLANs. No one cares anymore. All you care about is the layer three networks, meaning subnets in IPv4, or IPv6 that are associated with those. When we're dealing with uh, troubleshooting, you always contain the troubleshooting to that layer two broadcast domain. Quick uh, conversation about Overlay networking versus provider networking. Um, maybe I'll give you a short introduction into what provider networking is versus overlay networking in the context of, 
of OpenStack. Uh, provider networks in OpenStack uh, always have a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, a network that exists outside of the data center. That's a network that's been provisioned by the administrator, by, uh, by the operator. It always involves involvement outside of tenant in order to provision those networks. So a good example of those would be a VLAN. That is something that exists on a switch. That is not something that exists inside OpenStack unless you create a provider network which links that VLAN to, to an OpenStack network. Overlay networks, on the, other set, on, the, on the other hand, are managed by the tenant. The tenant can create those networks without the involvement of an operator or administrator. And uh, thanks to that, they are virtually unlimited. Uh, for example, if we look at uh, VLAN exams, I forgot what the maximum number is, but it's 60,000, 65,000. 65, uh, and compare, compare that to VLANs, which is 4,094, so uh, virtually unlimited. 64,000 will run out at some point, but it won't run out as quick as 4,000 VLANs. <laughs> now, what makes overlay networks more attractive to cloud use cases? The main benefit that we're looking at here is that self-service aspect of it, right? We're dealing with infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. We want our users to be able to request those. We don't want our users to put in, excuse me, we don't want our users to put uh, request tickets to IT for provisioning a new VLAN. So we're giving the power uh, to, to our users to create those inside um, our infrastructure. Some of the downsides of overlay networking, especially when used with conjunction with Kubernetes. Kubernetes uses its own networking model, and there's a good chance that we might take a little bit of a performance hit if we double encapsulate our traffic, right? If we're using VLAN, uh, VXLAN networks um, in OpenStack, and that OpenStack is also hosting a Kubernetes deployment on top, and we might be done, we will be double encapsulating, so we'll, we'll take some hits on performance. And from the standpoint of administrators who really like to have insight into what happens in your networks, well, those are not exactly, they don't really have insight into those. Those exist strictly in your compute environment or your Kubernetes environment. Um, Routed provider networks, of course, admins have perfect insight into them, they'll enjoy the full performance of the networking gear that uh, they exist on. Um, segmentation per site, that's also an interesting, an interesting notion here, especially when, when we're dealing with uh, spine and leaf networking. And less cloudy, interesting concept of being less cloudy. Uh, cloud is all about self-service, so if we pick provider networks and we try to build clouds on top of that, you don't want to run into roadblocks trying to pr 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 provision your, your networking. You want to deploy that application right away and self-provision networking for it, and that would be your choice with overlay networks. All right. Okay. So we have a, we have a million on the, on the call. He's going to give us, a, you know, he's going to walk us through how this works in the Kubernetes and give us a cool demo at the end. Uh, I don't know, Emilio, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was waiting for the beer, but you know, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Emilio, I'll stop sharing, and you can take over the screen. Okay. Thanks. So, first of all, yes, this is interactive. So even if I'm on the phone, feel free to. Uh, interact just uh, uh speak if there is anything any question um it seems like i have less than 15 minutes i might go over uh if no. that's fine um yeah. and um what else yes yeah, so my name is emilia um i'm uh i'm in canada uh i work for red hats um and yes yeah, so my job is to uh I used to I used to work a lot on on the OpenStack project for the last ten years, and now my focus is more on the integration between Kubernetes and OpenStack, uh, with a strong focus on uh, use cases like edge, telco, uh, and um, 
large-scale deployments when we uh, when we have uh, Kubernetes deployed on top of OpenStack. Um, I have a small. Uh, oh, I should share my screen, right? Yeah, if you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. We can keep looking at you. You're yeah. gorgeous on that big screen. <laughs> I'm not. I'm. I'm actually tired. <laughs> uh, all right, let me, okay. Let me share my screen. All right, I almost got this. Okay. All right, thanks. So, yeah, uh, small, uh, just a small note about uh, the following discussion. Again, it's, uh, it's about some working progress. Um, and yeah, um, and, and I'm going to present something that is under discussion in the community, uh, which doesn't mean that won't exist. It just means that uh, Right now, what you see is like a very early stage on uh, what we are working on. And, and you should feel very lucky to see that because uh, like, for example, uh, the upstream spec was proposed this week. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's very early. And uh, um, yeah, so what I'm proposing today um, is uh, it's a good follow up on, on what was presented uh, just before, uh, because it talks about exactly the same concept. So I'm, I'm not going to repeat what was said, uh, but um, I want to start with a little bit of uh, history here. And uh, like uh, it was mentioned before, but uh, when you wanted to scale uh, the, uh, the, uh, the data center, which can be OpenStack or something else. You you will create um, you will create the different sites, and some workloads will have to be uh, within the same layer two network for some reasons, uh, and that was the case of the Kubernetes control plane, um, for example, um, where uh, the uh, API and ingress traffic will have to be within the same network. Uh, and tools like uh, Keep Alive D and HU Proxy uh, would be managing this kind of traffic. Uh, at least that's the case uh, in OpenShift. Uh, but there are many ways of, of uh, you know, managing this uh, uh, networking uh, in the control plane. And uh, we are going to uh, go through uh, one of the uh, improvements that we are working on. But basically what you need to know is um, and, and that was mentioned before, uh, when you run one giant layer two network domain, uh, the, the, uh, the, the biggest issue that we have seen are traffic bottlenecks. Uh, and also uh, it's very difficult to maintain for the network administrators. Uh, so uh, especially when you have to extend like a, uh, a new availability zone for OpenStack, and on top of that zone, you want to install uh, the Kubernetes cluster uh, that has to communicate with another zone. It's very complex to implement uh, at the moment, and that's what we are trying to solve. Um, so, uh, and and again, what we are going to propose is is exactly what has been done in in the OpenStack. Uh, community where uh, we are bringing uh, more BGP into uh, into Kubernetes, uh, and not just for the workloads, but uh, for the control plane as well. Um, so um, I like to put a slide when I'm when I'm doing a presentation. I like to put a slide where I explain some use case um, and. Um, Let's say that today the use case is uh, you have a very large deployment of 
OpenStack and of course of Kubernetes. Uh, you have critical applications uh, and you have uh, very high SLA requirements. So, um, which means that if, for example, uh, in your data center, you have some power failure in, a, in on a rack or in a room, uh, the application that was running in, in this location has to be able to fail over very quick, very quickly to another area. So this this is a big challenge, uh, especially uh, you know uh, with the, all the, the constraint that you have with infrastructure. Um, so uh, OpenStack has this uh, architecture that is named uh, distributed compute nodes, uh, which can be also seen as the uh, reference architecture for Red Hat when it comes to deploy OpenStack at the edge. But you can also use this architecture to deploy OpenStack within the same data center. Uh, and, and you would think about the, uh, the, uh, the locations that you, remote, you, you have remote edge sites uh, in the same data center that would be just like a room or like a rack of servers that have indi uh, independent power and network resources. Um, so the idea is to be able to, uh, um, you know, do the same for Kubernetes, having uh, separate uh, resources and we can stretch uh, the cluster across those resources. Um, yeah, and just one note, but uh, BGP is a very popular protocol and has been used not just on the internet, but uh, in many data centers already. So, which is why it's kind of like the obvious protocol that we want to to use uh, uh, for, for, for the needs that we have. Um, so, um, this is kind of like, <laughs> this is, very much inspired from a from a previous slide, but kind of like more uh, uh, Kubernetes oriented. But um, on the left side, you have the tra the traditional architecture where um, you would have, let's say, two sites, uh, which we call failure domains. Uh, those can be two data centers, or again, they can be two rooms, two racks, uh, but they have. Uh, independent power and, and network resources, as you can see. Um, and, and we will basically deploy the Kubernetes cluster uh, on, on those two domains. Uh, but for the control plane to be able to work, you will have to stretch the, uh, the layer two network, which again, uh, can be very problematic. Uh, and the reason that you would have to stretch is because uh, most of the tools that are uh, used on the Kubernetes control plane now uh, only work uh, with, uh, uh, within the same network. Uh, for example, Keeper Live D uh, that is being used in OpenShift when you deploy OpenShift on top of bar metal, uh, VMware, uh, OpenStack, uh, and some other platforms, on-prem platforms. Um, Keeper Live D use the, the VRP protocol that requires the same layer to the, the same layer to network uh, between the, the the master nodes. Um, so it has limited SLA scalability limits, like we said. So I'm not going to repeat that. On the right side, you have the modern architecture, which is also named Spinal Leaf. Uh, and like the big difference here is that. Uh, you have three independent networks. Uh, so you could think about three independent subnets uh, that are connected to their uh, leaf routers and, and, and connected to the, spine, uh, to the spine L3. And what we are doing here is bringing down BGP down to the Kubernetes cluster control plane. Uh, so that's... Uh, the idea, uh, it's, it's a very big picture, and I know it's, it's late for most of us at this time. It's very difficult to process, even for me. But if you look at this, and I'm going to show a demo after that, um, and I can, I can go back and forth with the picture to show you exactly you know, what it means. But um, in, 
when you bring BGP down to the uh, to the uh, Kubernetes control plane, um, what you can do is uh, have the having the VIPs, so the uh, the Kubernetes uh, control plane uh, virtual IPs for API and ingress. Uh, you can also think about egress, um, and uh, we don't talk about the workloads today. Uh, because there are um, many tools in the Kubernetes community for um, uh, using uh, BGP uh, load balancers uh, for the workloads. Uh, you might know about uh, Metal LB, which is a very famous project, very popular, uh, which has uh, uh, FRR as a backend for BGP. So you, you can uh, create your uh, you can create a load balancer in Kubernetes uh, that will peer the, the route on how to reach the workload uh, to the BGP peers. So that's really for the workloads where today we speak about the control plane. Um, and what you see on the screen is um, basically three, uh, three sites, three availability zones um, that we also call three failure domains. Um, and each of them has a, a Kubernetes uh, master node. So you have, in total, you have three master nodes and uh, as much as workers as you want. So here we have only three, but you can have many as you want. Um, and the, the thing I want to highlight here is that the, you have a, a container for FRR that will manage uh, the the route distribute the route peering to the to the leaf and then to the spine uh, and it will peer the routes uh, to reach the vips and uh, we are working on uh, making it so uh, the vips will just be created by a simple uh, IP commands on the host uh, and FRR will watch for uh the those local routes to 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 uh to see if the vip does exist and if yes it will uh communicate this uh, uh through the bgp protocol uh in 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 the leaf and the leaf will communicate to the spine so um i'm going to start a demo uh it's it's a very quick and i would say simple demo and then I'm happy to take questions or go back to something if needed. Um, but what I want to show you is um, three masters with uh, ingress. So in, I want to see you that ingress uh, is uh, quickly uh, failed over and load balance between between the masters, uh, and um, and and that's. Uh, that's something I, I also want to show you in the, the BGP logs uh, that are on the on the host, uh, even though I'm sure it's not uh, uh, very useful to see to show you on all the logs, but at least you can see a little bit how it's wired. Uh, so I think I can stop sharing my slides and I will start sharing my other screen. All right. So you should see my screen okay, not too small, yeah. but if it's yeah. Small. Yeah. okay. So um, let's start with the basics. Oops. Um, I have, um, so this is my lab, okay? I don't have like three sites right now. I only have one, um, but I have a VM that uh, uh, replicates uh, like a spine router. Um, I have a VM for the uh, for the leaf router, and then I have three, uh, three uh, Kubernetes uh, master nodes. Um, what I want to show you is, um, one of the master nodes. Um, the master node has 
uh, the VIP uh, on the loopback device. If you look on the loopback device, you will see uh, 192, 168, 100.250, and 240. Those two IPs are the VIPs. Uh, one is for the API and the other one is for ingress, okay? So what we have here um, is, a, is a static pod running on the host, monitoring for the API and ingress controllers. And if the API and ingress are up and running, then it will create the VIP. And as soon as it creates the VIP, FRR, which also runs in a static pod on this host, will peer with the, the leaf router that, hey, I have this IP address here. If you want to know how to reach it, this is the route. So that's, it's all about that. So I'm going to show you the FRR uh, container. Um, okay, so this is just the logs of uh, the uh, FRR uh, static pod on, on my Kubernetes uh, control plane. Um, I can show you the configuration. If you're familiar with uh, BGP and FRR, uh, it's a pretty basic configuration, but uh, it's basically uh, uh, peering with the, uh, so the, uh, the uplink router is the leaf router, uh, the one that will later peer with the spine. Uh, and I, I have basically access list to uh, share the, the two VIPs that I want to, um, to route later. Um, we, we can do something funny after that. Uh, actually, I, yeah, I will, I will demo that. So, um, so on the right side, you have the three masters, okay? So uh, I'm going to run TCP dump uh, on, the, uh, on the IP address of ingress. And on the left side, I'm going to curl an application that I deployed in my cluster. So, so the uh, it seems like the ingress traffic is going on the master uh, number two. Okay, so this is great. Um, master two sees, seems up and running. Now, what happens if I change the health checks of ingress on the master two and force it to fail? So I, I, I don't want to destroy my cluster now because I want to keep the demo going. I'm just going to change the health check so you can see what happens uh, when, I, when I change the health check. So instead of doing just my regular curl, I'm just going to, to quit the script uh, exit one. I'm going to show you what happens in real time. Give me one second. Okay, so on the master two, uh, I'm just watching for the VIP on the local host to make sure that it's created. And on the right side, I'm going to write the, uh, the health check uh, script that should return an error. And what we should see is uh, the VIP being removed. And then I could even uh, show you the, uh, the FRR logs uh, to show you that the route will be changed. Uh, so if I, well, actually I could even 
go on the 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 this is the leaf router i don't know if we can grab for the vip okay let's see what happens okay so the route was removed sorry the vip was removed and the route as well on the leaf so what happens on the leaf was that it received an update you know to say exactly what happens and how to reach the the the, the, the new vip so now i only have one host where i can reach the vip if I go back and I remove my thing, I have two routes to reach my VIP. So let's let's do it again and now do my curl. And what I should see is TCP dump on the top right side, which is my uh, host that remains uh, uh, reachable to, to, to have the VIP. Okay, and now I can see the, the traffic on, on the other side. Um, I hope it's useful to wire things in your head about how we are using BGP. Um, but um, yeah. Um, how, long, how long does it take to switch over? So thanks to, uh, well, there are multiple things to, uh, to take in account here. Um, there is, uh, of course, there is BFD, and BFD is uh, incredibly fast. Uh, if you know about it, uh, it's 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 a matter of few milliseconds. Uh, it's also a matter of, uh, you know, how do you implement the static pods in Kubernetes uh, to manage the VIPs? Um, right now, it's a loop that watch for the help check you know uh but it's it's really fast it's really fast and um what we are aiming for is uh one second on of convergence for api and three seconds for ingress so that's what we are aiming for right now uh, but we could we could even go faster it's just a matter of how much cpu it will consume uh so it's it's something that you have to to, to choose at some points. It's a balance. Do you, yeah. do you find that BFD consumes a lot of CPU when it's checking that aggressively? No, but the health checks on Kubernetes, yes. Those are expensive? Yes. Like? Yes, they are. Well, individually they are not, but when you have like multiple VIPs, uh, multiple scripts and multiple masters, that becomes expensive. So you need to be careful, you know? Uh, but what you see right here is uh, it's it's an implementation that is not too much uh, expensive in terms of CPU. And as you could see, it's almost real time. So, yeah. yeah. What's the tie-in between the health check and, and the, the route, the VIP route being removed? How does that work? So, once the health checks return the failure, uh, the you know we have um, I, I can you want me to go in the code or what? <laughs> no, just just, just high level. I, I wasn't sure if there's some we, special pieces. We, we basically we basically remove the IP address from the loopback device as as long as the uh, the health checks reports a failure, which means that as soon as the VP is removed, FRR will will see it immediately. Yeah. Well, actually, BFD will remove will will see it immediately, and and then the as you saw, you saw it the, the 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 BGP route is being updated. So it's really fast. Yes. Um, so yeah, what's next? Um, like I said, it's it's under design. It's under POC, uh, but it's made pretty good progress on that. Uh, I hope uh, we can ship that as tech preview in the next uh, in the next cycle. 
Um, and um, yeah, I mean, what's very interesting in that uh, architecture is, and what I like the most is um, comparing to the traditional architecture where in the stretch layer two, uh, it's kind of like, uh, uh, um, not real, not real, not real agile. Like the services, the API in Ingress, they have to be uh, share. They have to share the same resources. But with BGP, you kind of like open the door to many configurations, many possible configurations, because um, in in BGP, uh, the one of the important configuration that will need to be done is on 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 the leaf and the spine networks. So uh, you can increase convergence time by configuring BGP in a certain way in your spine. Or if you want to do uh, API load balancing, you can configure BGP in a certain way uh, in your leaf. So there is a lot of things that we won't have control and that's for the best. So you give back some control on um, infrastructure networking uh, back to the network admins. And I think it's very important, uh, especially for Kubernetes, uh, to not have control on everything. Uh, and and this 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 uh, this new architecture where uh, we will just be peering what's happening on the cluster. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's going to be great. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the next step. Uh, uh, tech, from a technical point of view, we are working on the API for uh, Kubernetes failure domains uh, in the uh, cloud provider uh, cloud provider OpenStack. Uh, there is an upstream uh, spec that is being done right now uh, in Kubernetes, uh, and that will allow us to deploy uh, the clusters. Uh, across multiple failure domains. Right now, the demo, as you see, it's in, in one failure domain, but we are working on, uh, you know, stretching the cluster across multiple domains. So that's, it's kind of like a, a, a parallel effort of, of BGP. Is there any uh, questions? I'm very happy to answer. Anyone still awake? <laughs> so this is very good, right? A uh, couple of more things we want may want to look at in the future, right? It's <coughs> performance and scale, right? As we scale the number of BTP sessions, the mesh scale, and uh, number of nodes in the mesh, etc., number of routes and all those things, what impact it has on the audit performance as well, right? So that's something to yeah, and um, again, right now we are just talking about like like potentially two IP addresses that we want to route, which is the ingress and the API. But we need to think about um, the uh, the collaboration with the workloads, and I'm talking about yes. uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, Metal LB. Um, we are. And, and this is very early discussion right now, but we are thinking about um, whether or not we need to make the, the control plane BGP instance collaborating with the BGP instance of Metal LB, kind of like sharing the same, because as you know, yes. you, can, you cannot have easily, you cannot have um, uh, two BGP sessions on the same network. Uh, between the, the same two nodes. Uh, Cisco has uh, something that they implement, but in FRR, you don't have such a thing. Um, although we are investigating how we could do that, uh, but uh, the idea would be uh, that in the end, we will share uh, BGP, you know, BGP configs and BGP sessions between uh, the workloads and the control plane. Uh, Potentially, so sure, all, sure. all of this is kind of like roadmap for the next twelve months, kind of. Yes, yes. and, and using it as a route reflector 
on the control control node would be another option too, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So so question. I, I appreciate the uh, the demo and the and the uh, the talk, guys. Um, I understand the networking side and and why we would want to do that. I'm curious um, how you're handling the database synchronization amongst multi multi site um, across the the control planes. The uh, do you, which which database? Oh, OpenStack is, is is MySQL for the most part. Oh, um, oh okay. And then oh, okay. and obviously etcd or something like that with with uh, with Kube. I, I can take that one. Uh, so. Since the controllers are now distributed on uh, separate layer three networks, they all have layer three connectivity. We're just using a Galera cluster. So in, in that aspect, the database replication mechanism doesn't change. It is just using a different transport. It's still an IP transport, but we're using layer three networking to do the replication. But are you splitting sites with um, like separate physical locations a controller in each physical location, for example, or you're just yes. Picking, yes. Okay. So, in with in yes. with that, are you pointing? So, your compute nodes are then talking to that local controller. That well, there's a, there's a dip address, right, that's being presented, and so whenever uh, the the controller needs to talk back to to the control plane services, it uses that VIP. Yep. And only one is, of course, active at the set at a time. So, so you have compute nodes then still hopping across site sites theoretically. Um, yes. It's just talking to the local. Yep. Yeah. So still, for still the, the database. Are, yeah. Still yeah, the database. Yeah. Is that? I don't think that's such a heavy traffic, right? Like the, from that perspective, nothing has changed from the from the previous architecture, yeah. right? It's 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 pretty much the same. But uh, again, I think the I think the limitation that we're trying to remove is again like putting everything in the same L two and like getting the a broadcast storm, right, and, and killing the entire control plane. Uh, but the rest of it, I think there's, I don't know, uh, there's really uh, not too many changes in the, in the other components, how they work, right? It's just like, kind of, we're working around, uh, you know, the, the networking flow, but, but all of the other, you know, all of the other components, they work exactly the same as they have before. As far as of ETCD, it's it's pretty much the same answer. Uh, and ETCD recommends to run ETCD cluster within the same data center. And if you have to, uh, you know, like for uh, if if you want to deploy ETCD an, another node into another failure domain, they they recommend to use a very close data center. But again, the use case of um, this. Uh, large deployment that requires a very high SLA for the applications, um, they they are deployed within the same data center and they use different racks and power and networks, but yeah, the latency should sense. be really close. Yeah, the, the, the latency. Makes total sense, yeah. Absolutely. Right, yeah, you're, yeah. Doing, you're doing basically a rack is a failure zone or, or a... Right. Or it, but it's all within the same the same segment. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know if you're looking, Ken, for like a geographically distributed yep. controllers. I don't think that model would fit here, right? Like, yep. it would be too much latency uh, to like geographically distribute them, right? Yep. Like, you, you still need to be conscious of like keeping those lo latencies low between all of the AZs. Yep, thanks guys. All right. Hey, if there's no more question, we, I know we, we took a little bit longer. We appreciate everyone who stayed with us. I, Emilia, that was that was awesome demo. I haven't seen this before, so it was first time for me. I, me, I love it. Me ship neither. It, just me neither. ship it and we're, we're ready to go. That was great, yeah. I, I didn't see this demo either before because it works since like yesterday also. So. <laughs> Very cool. I'm glad hey, you liked it. So yeah, thanks so much everyone for, for joining. This this session was recorded and we're gonna post it on uh it's gonna be posted on Open Infra Foundation too if you wanna go back and check some of the details and ping, ping us up if you need like any more information too.
Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys.